Hi everyone. So we've recently been exploring using the ketogenic diet and other metabolic therapies as a treatment for my mental health condition. I live with schizoaffective disorder, but we've been receiving a lot of concern from people who are watching this journey around how the ketogenic diet, which is a high fat diet, impacts heart health and particularly its impact on cholesterol. So in today's video, I'm joined by Dr. Brett Schur. Dr. Schur is a cardiologist and a metabolic health specialist. He is also the director of Metabolic Mind, which we've talked about before on this channel. Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit working to transform the study and treatment of mental disorders by exploring the connection between metabolism and brain health. They also have a YouTube channel called Metabolic Mind, which is a huge resource for people who are looking to learn more about metabolic health. We'll link to their channel in the description below. I also just want to give a quick disclaimer that while Dr. Schur is a doctor who is giving medical information in this video, he is not providing individualized medical advice. And if you have specific questions about your own health, please consult with your treating doctor. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm joined today by Dr. Brett Schur. Dr. Schur, it's so exciting to have you on the channel here today. You are the host of the other YouTube channel that we reference regularly, Metabolic Mind, where you provide such great information about metabolic therapies and mental illness. So thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me on. So I guess just to dive right in, we're going to be talking today about keto and cholesterol or heart issues. You know, as a cardiologist or a background in cardiology, you know, why are you such a strong advocate for the ketogenic diet? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I guess I'm, the short answer is I'm such a strong advocate because it does things no other diet can do. And it does things that no medications can do. And that is it can change our fuel source so that we're no longer burning glucose, but we're burning fat and creating ketones and using ketones for fuel. And that is a whole different physiologic state. It is a powerful medical intervention. And that's that's one of the things I really like to promote when I talk about ketosis is we're not just talking about a diet for weight loss. Like that's fine. That works and people can choose that. But we're talking about a medical intervention that puts chronic conditions into remission, whether it's type 2 diabetes or whether it's bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or whether it's treating, you know, cognitive impairment or treating ulcerative colitis, or it can be used as a medical therapeutic intervention. And that that's what I think is so powerful about the state of ketosis. Now, it happens that you can get there through a diet. So that's where this sort of, I don't know, confusion of keto diet equals ketogenic therapy. They're not, they're not really the same, even though they have sort of the same basis. But anyway, that's a from the short to the long answer of why I'm so passionate about using ketosis as a, as an intervention to help people live healthier lives. No, that's a healthy way or a helpful way to frame it for people. Cause I think that people have this assumption of the keto diet as being this fad diet for essentially weight loss, but really framing it as a really serious medical intervention, you know, coming from a doctor who uses it to prescribe it for people with health conditions is helpful. So another really important thing to realize is, is the mainstream media gets ketosis wrong. And, and here's what I mean by this. You'll, there've been a number of examples where you see a headline that a keto like diet increases risk of heart disease or low carb diet increases risk of heart disease. And here it's really important how we define low carb or this one study was keto like. And again, remember when I said ketosis is different because it changes your physiology. So what that means is if you're studying a diet that has 25% of your calories from carbohydrates and calling it a keto-like diet, that's a complete misnomer. But yet that was a headline all over social media and traditional media that a keto-like diet increases risk of heart disease, but it had nothing to do with a ketogenic diet. So it was just false. And there are other studies that say low carb diets increase your risk of heart disease. And they define that as 40% of your calories from carbs. So again, ridiculously high number of carbs when related to a keto diet. So nothing to do with it. And that can be really confusing. And that's what frustrates me. And for the average person to see this, they're going to read that headline and say, oh, keto is dangerous. But when it has nothing to do with the state of ketosis, it's just incredibly misleading. So that's another thing that I really want to just shout from the rooftops for people to understand that since ketosis is a unique physiologic state, 
that we cannot compare it and think it's the same as these general sort of low carb studies, which really are not that low carb. Right. I think that is like a really big problem in terms of the meshing of information for, you know, the kind of fad diet, keto like low carb diets for weight loss and whatnot with what you're saying, you know, the state of being in ketosis and what you need to medically eat keto to get into that state. And I think that that's very confusing for a lot of people to kind of wade through the deferring information around that. So thank you for clarifying that as well. But the keto diet is obviously very high in fats. And we've always been kind of fed this narrative that too much fat is bad for us, especially fats like saturated fats. So can you start by explaining why fats can actually be good for someone who's following a medical keto diet? Yeah, well, and and I guess the, the first thing to clarify is a ketogenic diet does not have to have saturated fat. There are plenty of people who have a very low or no saturated fat ketogenic diet to help them with ketogenic therapy. So I guess that's the other point is ketosis, right, isn't a diet. It can be a vegetarian diet, a vegan diet, a carnivore diet, a Mediterranean diet, omniv- you know, there's so many different diets that can achieve ketosis. So, so that's the first point. It doesn't have to have saturated fat. But what's different about a ketogenic diet in the state of ketosis is you're burning that fat. You're using that fat as your primary fuel source. So compare that to eating a lot of fat plus a lot of carbohydrates. You're burning the carbohydrates first and storing the fat. So two completely different situations. So if you're going to study a diet that has 50% carbohydrates and a lot of fat and saturated fat and tends to be hypercaloric. And that's a completely different scenario. Anything you learn from that scenario likely isn't going to translate to eating fat in a ketogenic diet because now you're burning it instead of storing it as the primary response. And you tend to be improving your metabolic health. You tend to be eating less, right? So it's a very different scenario. And that's sort of a a problem or a trap that doctors fall into, dietitians fall into, and the general public fall into that thinking they're the same when they really aren't. So you ask, like, how can fat be helpful for someone following a medical keto diet? Well, that's where your energy is coming from. That's where your calories that you burn for energy are coming from. And that's what allows you also to help produce maybe higher levels of ketones. So what do I mean by that? Well, Like I said, when you're in ketosis, you're burning fat for fuel, right? So now your fat is your fuel source, but you make ketones by lowering your carbohydrates enough that you're burning fat. Now it's a spectrum. You could have ketones at the low level of nutritional ketosis, like 0.5 millimoles uh, per liter, or up to the higher level, you know, four or five, where, where you sit on your videos, you tend to run. So some people can, can, work their way up that spectrum by adding more fat or adding different kinds of fat. That's like MCT oil. Not that everybody needs to, but that's where it can be used as fat can be used as a tool to get you there. But at its, at its base, fat is your fuel source, your energy source, and what keeps you maybe from being hungry as well um, when you're following a ketogenic diet. So it actually is really important. Um, yeah. Right. So I guess fat is more of that kind of maybe harmful component if you're consuming a lot of carbs as well. And that is your fuel source. But if you eliminate that and you switch to fat as fuel source, it's healthy to consume more fats. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I mean, it's it's certainly helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't say that fat is like, a, you know, in itself is a health food and is going to make you healthy in and of itself. But as part of this uh, dietary matrix to get you into ketosis, yes, then it's serving its purpose to help you on that health journey that ketosis is helping you on. It's an important part of ketosis because you can get into ketosis with fasting, right? And maybe right. you get similar benefits, but you can't do that long term. So right. you need you need calories, you need energy, you need food, and that's where fat comes in. But you know, not to ignore protein. Protein is also really important, especially if you want to improve your metabolic health um, and have lean muscle mass. Um, and be, you know, have, have energy and strength. Um, you need protein as well. Um, but protein isn't the direct fuel source. Protein is more of sort of the building blocks where fat is the direct fuel source. And whether that's saturated fat or monounsaturated fat, you know, it, 
it likely doesn't matter um, for each individual to an extended degree, but you can choose the type of fats that work best for you and your dietary uh, makeup. Right. Okay. So a common concern that's coming up from a lot of people in our audience and people, you know, questioning the keto diet is the increase in cholesterol, you know, as being Mm -hmm. a common concern around following the keto diet and the high amounts of fat intake and LDL is a particular concern. So I guess, first of all, can you start off by explaining what even is LDL cholesterol? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, when we talk about cholesterol, we talk about usually LDL and HDL are the main, um, particles. Now, these are sort of the boats that transport the cholesterol in our body. And cholesterol is something we need all over our bodies, whether it's our brains, our cells, the cell membranes. It is a component of life. We cannot live without cholesterol, which is important to know. Um, But as it's being transported through our bodies in either an LDL or HDL particles, studies have shown that the higher the level of LDL particles the higher the risk of developing heart disease. Now, that's a very, very general statement because there there may be lots of caveats in there about, you know, the size of the particles, the degree of inflammation or oxidation, and the metabolic health of the person. So that's something we can get into. But the, the point being, what we're taught in medicine, what we're taught in the general public is the higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the risk of heart disease. So that's what gets people really worried about a ketogenic diet. But here's the other important part about nutritional ketosis, ketogenic therapy. The majority of the studies looking at a ketogenic diet for weight loss or for treating type 2 diabetes show no net increase in LDL cholesterol, which surprises a lot of people to hear because they just the assumption is you start a keto diet, your LDL goes up. It's like assumed to be to be the case, but the science says the exact opposite. That actually no it doesn't increase. And in fact, there was one study published by the um, team at Verta Health that showed a net reduction in cardiovascular risk. So you can calculate, you know, doctors use this all the time, cardiologists use it all the time, this calculator to say, what are your risks of heart disease? And by starting a ketogenic diet for a year, they lowered their risk by 12%. Again, that's something that surprises people because the assumption is it goes the opposite way. Now, I think part of the reason for that is because there is this subgroup of people whose LDL goes up quite a bit, and that is getting a lot of attention, um, takes up a lot of oxygen in the room because it's interesting, it's different, and it has people concerned. But the first point that I think is so important to make is that that is the exception, not the rule, right? That is the minority, not the majority. The majority of the people are going to see their triglycerides improve, their HDL improve, their blood sugar improve their blood pressure improve, and either improvement or no change in their LDL. So that's a net benefit. Whereas this other group will see all those benefits, plus their LDL may go up. So that's really important. So the next question, though, is how much of a concern is that? But before we even get to that, I just can't impress enough that the majority of the people do not see an increase in their LDL and see an actual improvement in their cardiovascular risk. I think that's the most important concept here. Okay. Is there any idea as to why certain small subsets of people, their LDL does increase? Because I think actually I took my, my, I got, I got my blood done before starting keto and then about a month after, and my LDL actually did increase a little bit. So I guess, is there any insight into why that does happen for some people? Yeah. And you're the the perfect person for someone it would happen to someone who is um, thin, athletic, and metabolically healthy. That's who it tends to happen to. So um, we really have to tip our hats to Dave Feldman, who's an engineer. Um, his website's cholesterolcode.com. Um, and he has sort of helped create a team to publish papers and do research studies and investigate this concept of people who LDL goes up quite a bit. And he's he's coined this term lean mass hyperresponder because what he's found is that people who tend to have a, a higher LDL after starting a ketogenic diet tend to be leaner, um, tend to be more active, um, and tend to be more metabolically healthy. So it seems like you would fit that. And there, and you know, there obviously there are a number of people who do, even if it, they're the minority, not the majority, but they might be the ones using a ketogenic diet to treat their ulcerative colitis, to treat their 
bipolar disorder or whatever the case may be because they're not using it to treat it for type 2 diabetes or obesity who are the people who tend to not get a rise in their LDL. Right. Um, but even so, but in that situation, then the question is, does an increased LDL for this subset mean the same for someone who is metabolically unhealthy, who has high blood pressure, who is overweight, who, you know, has type 2 diabetes? And the answer is likely it doesn't mean the same, but we have a lot more to learn about that still. Right. Okay. So I guess, yeah, we're, we're the LDL cholesterol is kind of a classic biomarker as cause for concern, but perhaps wondering if there are other biomarkers that may be more effective or relevant to look at or monitor for those who are following a ketogenic diet. Yeah, that's such a great point. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about LDL cholesterol um, because that's what we've done for decades in, in medicine, because that's what we have a medication for. Um, but it is one risk marker. And cardiovascular risk is a multifactorial project, you could say, right? And um, it's you have to pay attention to your LDL, your HDL, your triglycerides, your blood pressure, your waist size, um, your blood sugar, your insulin levels, um, your inflammatory markers. If, if you really want to know your cardiovascular risk, you want to know all of these factors. And then you can go even further and, and just measure and look at your arteries themselves. So we'll talk about that. But first talking about, you know, different blood tests. There, there have been two really interesting studies that have come out in the past few years that looked at, okay, we're going to look at LDL and its contribution to predicting cardiovascular risk. We're also going to look at things like an insulin resistance score or type 2 diabetes. And this one study showed LDL um, had an increased risk of 1.4. All right, so one means no increased risk. So 1.4 is a little bit up. Um, this other component, ApoB, which you can think of as like a more accurate LDL, was 1.8. So by comparison, type 2 diabetes was 10. Insulin resistance was 6. I mean, not 1.6, but 6. So it shows that maybe we're not focusing on the most impactful risk factors when it comes to cardiovascular health. Not that we should ignore LDL, but we need to put it into perspective of these other markers or other risk factors with metabolic health, I think, being the primary one. So metabolic health is it tends to be um, diagnosed or monitored by your, whether it's your waist circumference, your, um, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your insulin levels, um, your triglycerides, your HDL, all these components can fit into your metabolic health, which are likely more impactful than LDL. Again, not that saying LDL can be ignored, but put in into perspective. But then you can go even better and say, well, look, maybe we can actually, instead of trying to use a surrogate as blood marker and say, what does this mean for your arteries? We can actually just look at your arteries. We can do tests like a coronary calcium score or carotid intima media thickness test or a CT angiogram. And we can get into the details of all these if you want. But the point being that there are other tests you can do that actually look at the arteries themselves. You don't have to guess based on a blood test. Right. Okay. Um, are there are there certain people or are there certain situations where you may need to pay closer attention to rising LDL levels? You know, you said that it's it's not the most common outcome for LDL levels to rise, but is there any subset of people or any health situations where you would need to pay closer attention to that? Mm. Yeah. And, and actually, I guess the first thing is everybody should pay attention to it, right? So I, I would not encourage anybody to ignore it. When I say put it into perspective, you're still paying attention to it. But those who, who really need to pay attention to it are people who have pre-existing heart disease. So for whatever reason you've, you've known, you have have a higher calcium score, you've had a heart attack or a stent or whatever, um, mm -hmm. then absolutely you want to pay attention to that. If you don't have good metabolic health, if you have high blood pressure, if you have type 2 diabetes, other risk factors, then it's just an additive risk factor and you need to pay attention to it. Strong family history of, of heart disease, you want to pay attention to it, right? Any of these risk factors for heart, other risk factors for heart disease that you have increases the risk overall. So of course you want to pay attention to it. And even if you have none of those risk factors, you still want to pay attention to it but you want to make sure that you're evaluating it within the context of your overall risk. So I see a lot of patients in my practice of people who 
who I guess want reassurance to say, hey, I, can you tell me I'm a hyper responder so don't have to worry about my LDL? And frequently I end up saying, well, no, I can't tell you that because you have a calcium score of 300 or because you have a strong family history of heart disease or because your blood pressure is still elevated, right? These other things add on to the risk of that LDL. So maybe we do have to take it a little more seriously. And, you know, when it comes to addressing LDL, there are so many different things you can do. Um, if you're using a ketogenic diet to treat a chronic medical condition, whether it's bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, ulcerative colitis, whatever the case may be, you're getting some benefit from that, right? So chances are, if you're getting significant benefit, you don't want to just undo the keto diet. Because one thing you can do is just cycle in carbs to lower your LDL. But what are the risks of that? So if the risk is you're going to undo the benefit you're seeing, you probably don't want to do that. So if you're worried about the LDL, if, you're, if your physician and you decide you want to lower the LDL, there are so many different options to do it from herbs and supplements and medications um, that, that it can easily be done while maintaining the benefits of ketosis. So it's not that the two are mutually exclusive. They can definitely go together in the appropriate circumstance. Okay. And I guess are other forms of metabolic therapy, such as exercise, does, like, does that play any role in mitigating issues like rises in cholesterol for people who are on keto, or is it more what you were just talking about in terms of managing cholesterol levels? Yeah, you know, interestingly, exercise does not have as much of an impact on LDL. It can have a small impact, usually seems to be mitigated with weight loss, though, from, from exercise. It looks like at least that's what the studies tend to show. It can impact triglycerides and HDL and metabolic health and blood pressure. It can definitely impact all of those, which are certainly beneficial um, and highly recommended, uh, but a little bit less of an impact on LDL. Okay. And I guess just to kind of wrap things up, a final question is, are there people who should specifically avoid using the ketogenic diet for their you know, for heart health reasons or other health reasons, you know, maybe people who are on statins or, you know, mm -hmm. is there anyone who should maybe avoid using a ketogenic diet for heart health yeah. reasons? There, there are very, very few people who absolutely should avoid it. And those tend to be people who have, um, uh, inborn, I guess you could call it defects for fat metabolism, just the way they're born, they, their body can't metabolize fat as well. And usually this is diagnosed in childhood. So most people know this. Aside from that, there's really nobody who absolutely shouldn't, but there are people who, you know, need to be cautious about it. So certainly anybody who's taking medications for type 2 diabetes, it can, you know, ketogenic diet works well for lowering your blood sugar. So if you're on a medication to lower your blood sugar, you could actually get into big trouble by lowering it too much. Same for high blood pressure medication. And the same can be true for anybody taking a, a psychiatric medication because there can be an interaction there with, with benefits, but that may potentiate side effects of, of some of the medications, right? So there, there's a lot of caution that needs to be used when using ketosis as a medical intervention. But that's very different from saying, oh, you can't do a ketogenic diet because you have type 1 diabetes or because you're on insulin or because you have a psychiatric diagnosis. No, it's not that you can't do it. It's that it just needs a little precaution and should be done with an experienced healthcare practitioner. Right. And I think that that's a big part of what I'm taking away from this conversation with you is that there's a lot of things that need to be monitored by a healthcare provider, a physician. Um, you know, to make sure that all these things are under control and managed well while using a medical keto diet. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And, and I think in an ideal world, we would, you know, all be able to see a physician of whatever specialty we want, who is knowledgeable and experienced with ketogenic therapies. Now, that's not the case, at least not yet. Hopefully that will change over time. Um, and there are some great resources out there, whether it's um, Diet Doctor or Society for uh, Metabolic Health Practitioners or Diagnosis Diet, who have directories um, to find these clinicians. But the point I want to make here is that if, if you can't find a physician to do it, you can work with a dietitian or a health coach or somebody else who can help with the details of ketogenic therapy and help with the communication with your physician to help bring the physician along with this process. Um, so they know what to monitor for. They know what the, you know, they, the physician can learn as they're going and being educated by this allied health professional. I think that's, that's another important concept that people can, 
um, should embrace basically if they can't find a physician who will work with them. But hopefully, you know, more physicians are getting trained and learning about this. So hopefully that will start to continue to improve. Absolutely. That's what I'm doing where my physician and my psychiatrist don't really know much about this, but they were open to learning from um, a specialist nutritionist who I'm working with, who's kind of guiding how to monitor it. So that is absolutely an option. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Sher, for providing more information about this concern that a lot of people are bringing forward about using the ketogenic diet as a means of treating mental illness, you know, this issue around heart health and cholesterol and all that. So thank you so much for providing more information and knowledge about that. It was really great hearing from you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So a really big thank you again to Dr. Brett Scherr for joining us today to talk with us specifically about heart health and cholesterol as it pertains to the keto diet. If you would like to learn more about this and a multitude of other topics pertaining to keto and metabolic health, definitely check out the Metabolic Mind YouTube channel. Again, we'll link to that in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and as always, wishing you and your loved ones good health. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.